something so bad that it's good, but quickly transcends into being utterly boring. Good. Like your and if you didn't manage to try it firsthand, you can count yourself as one of the lucky ones. No, the score graphic... But in its current state, it is... Like a half-baked extraction shooter, a shooter that extract ended up not being that at all and turned out to just be another extraction shooter on a disjointed no. map. On first impressions, no, I don't recommend buying or playing the day before. In fact, I've sent in a, a refund request on Steam. I've blown past my two-hour limit. As everyone is aware, the day before and its development studio, Fantastic, have shut down. With a 96-hour lifetime, the day before has possibly had one of, if not the most drastic buildups and fall downs in gaming history. But many questions remain. Who is this studio? Were the warning signs always there? What actually was the purpose of this game? All of these and more will be answered. But the most important question of them all, who was really behind the day before? Let's turn the clock back a bit. In 2015, Fantastic Studio was founded in the Serbian city of Yakutsk, Russia. Within two years, they released their first game, The Wild Eight. Not much is known about the creation or early years of this development studio. And as of the time of making this video, the website is only one page, which relays their studio shutdown message along with a prompt that their publishing company, Mytona, will be issuing refunds. We'll talk about them later. The Wild Eight began as a Kickstarter project by the studio which raised its $50,000 goal within 11 days and capped just shy of $60,000, with nearly 1,300 backers. The game centered around players crash landing from a plane in Alaska, forcing themselves to survive in the cold wilderness. Now, it should be noted that Fantastic Studio did not originally go by this name. The Russian-based game studio went by a different calling card during their first project's funding and development. Eight points. This is shown through the game's original Kickstarter page, plus their defunct Twitter, Facebook, and website. This is something important to remember later on. The game was released to moderate success and generally favorable reviews. Between the release of The Wild Eight and the development of their next project, Dead Dozen, the studio went through some internal struggles, which resulted in The Wild Eight to be sold off to their publisher at the time, Hype Train Digital, as well as Eight Points rebranding to Fantastic Studio. The details of why the game was sold are sparse, citing internal conflict with partners within the company as the main reason behind the transaction. The studio's second game, Dead Dozen, was described as, quote, a multiplayer action horror game where you turn into a ghoul after your death as a human. It took place in an abandoned Soviet research base in Serbia during the year 1993. The game was released in March of 2018 and received mixed to mostly negative reviews. The game received a small amount of updates until June of that year with the 2.2.0 patch, the final update to the game. It would remain abandoned until its retirement from Steam on October 31st, 2021. Soon, after Dead Dozen's final update, the studio had released their third project, Radiant One. This would be the first big shift the studio would take, creating a story-driven, single-player game compared to their more co-op survival games in the past. The game centered around your character, Daniel, who had gained mastery over lucid dreaming, 
he would eventually go through tests and trials given to him by the universe to reach enlightenment. It was praised for its art style and well-written narrative. At this point, the studio had released three games within three years of the studio's founding, two of which were released within the same year. However, one game was no longer owned by the studio, one game had unofficially been abandoned, and one was a single-player game that never got a single update. It seemed like Fantastic were wiping the slate clean and trying to start something new. Something bigger. That's exactly what they did. Prop Knight was the studio's next game, one that many people have heard of. The game combines elements of the Prop Hunt game mode from Gary's Mod and Dead by Daylight. The game was announced on October 15, 2021, and released in December on Steam that same year. This was easily Fantastic's most successful game yet. Estimates of sales are upwards of 200000 which totals nearly $3 million. Although reviews of the game were mixed throughout its release, the game was a huge payoff for Fantastic after its nearly three-year development. The studio was continuing to gain more and more notoriety and status in the industry, which would fuel them for their most ambitious project yet. It should be noted as well that this was the first instance since The Wild Eight that Fantastic Studio did not self-publish their game. Instead, it was handled by Mytona. Now, at this point, you probably don't care or are that interested in the studio's history, but I believe it's important because knowing their past, we can at least assume about their future. We know today that the day before's release was nowhere near the same product as what was shown during its early promotion. And given the studio's track record of having issues with previous publishers, creating games with extensive issues upon release, and not supporting them, plus never having worked on an MMO before, Fantastic was almost destined to fail from the start. From the blatant copying of trailers, lying about using Unreal assets, and being a complete mockery of what was shown through advertisements, make no mistake, the game is not good, nor anywhere near what was intended. It's honestly quite absurd how many signs there were that this game was not going to do well, the writing wasn't just on the wall, it was bolded, underlined, and italicized. It cannot be understated how ambitious of a project this was for Fantastic. Going from a five-person multiplayer hide-and-seek to a massive multiplayer online open-world zombie survival game is outrageous. They simply were not equipped to handle something this ambitious. We don't have a ton of information to go off of for exact numbers of employees at Fantastic, but we do have some. Using web page archives and saved videos, we can look a bit into the company's structure and culture. A term that has been repeated by brothers Asian and Eduard Gotostev, directors of Fantastic Studio, is volunteers. Volunteers. Volunteer? Volunteering. Volunteer. Every Fantastic team member is a volunteer for life. Now, this doesn't seem to be a mistranslation or accidental usage, as the Kotostev brothers were clearly shown to have a moderate to high level of English speaking skills. Calling employees volunteers seems to be deliberate, but why? Frankly, this is one of the points that I struggle to find reason for. Fantastic's statement on the matter by a quote given to Eurogamer is, Essentially, the word volunteer comes from the Latin word voluntarius, meaning willing, or of one's own choice. They continued to explain that there were over a hundred internal volunteers hailing from around the world, including Singapore, Russia, the Netherlands, Thailand, Ukraine, Finland, Kazakhstan, and Belarus. They also had 40 other external volunteers that helped with QA testing and language localization. 
I want to emphasize that anyone working on the game, salaried or not, was labeled as a volunteer at Fantastic. I'm not aware of any other company ever that has done this. Now, the more charitable answer would be to say that Fantastic is calling their team of all remote employees volunteers as a counterculture to label the developers in a more passionate light. They're not working because they have to, they're working because they are willing to of one's own choice. But I don't think that is entirely true. Could labeling their employees as volunteers exempt them from certain taxes or other regulations from Singapore? I did my best to research this on my own without finding anything concrete. I could very well be looking too deep into this, but I find it strange nonetheless. Fantastic, although founded in Russia, was based in Singapore. But looking at the Singapore business directory, they only registered their business headquarters back in October of 2021, just two weeks after revealing the game's original release date of June 21st, 2022. In a Yahoo News article written by Aloysius Lowe, published on December 13th, 2023, he detailed his encounter of going to the Fantastic Studio office in Singapore and gives light to some of their finances. I popped by their office, which was located inside a mixed retail space in Bailsteer, an area in the central region of Singapore. I tried looking for the company's name at the tenant directory, only to discover it was a co-op working space. Since that was the case, I figured there was no harm in heading up to look around. I had also planned to check in with the other tenants should the staff from Fantastic not be around. Alas, I was greeted by the co-op's cheerful center manager, who told me that Fantastic merely used the co-op's address as a virtual office space. That possibly rules out of having staff here who are working on the game. I also looked up their original address, based on their filings via Google Maps, which puts them in the Peninsula Plaza. However, a quick check online in the building's online directory shows no such tenant. Instead, the original address belongs to a management consultancy. Lowe also wrote that based on his findings of their financial records, both Gotovsev brothers put forth 50,000 Singaporean dollars each as capital, and no money nor grants were given for their projects while working in Singapore. From their 2022 financial filings, which details finances from October 29, 2021 to December 31, 2022, they had a revenue of $3.4 million, with a profit after taxes and operating expenses totaling nearly $1.3 million. However, this does not include each of the brothers' $100,000 salary and over $300,000 in traveling expenses. Subtracting an additional $500,000, ending their profit for the year at about $840,000. But, at the same time, the company did nearly have a $500,000 term loan taken out, showing that they ended 2022 with a bank account balance of nearly 1.5 million Singaporean dollars. There were no such documents found detailing employee payroll records, as the ones of the directors, of course. For an independent company, especially one in which their entire workforce was virtual, they were profitable. The books and leaked sales figures of the day before prove this. So what happened? How did a game seemingly in development for five years with almost 150 developers seemingly disappear overnight? Let's break down the timeline. January 2021. This was the first we ever heard about the day before, in a now-deleted YouTube video. The developers show off five minutes of gameplay, including combat, stealth, crafting, and inventory management. The trailer was well-received by fans, praising its Division-style gameplay, combined with elements from other games like The Last of Us, DayZ, and Days Gone. 
February 2021. Even more gameplay is shown less than a month later with statements from Diana Platanova, the CBO at Mytona, and the Gotosev brothers. April 2021. Another gameplay video is shown two months later to showcase the world, driving, looting, and zombie fights. October 2021. There was silence for a while, but on October 15th, we saw the release date trailer, accompanied by more gameplay. Funny enough, in this trailer, the release date was shown to be June of 2025, but the last number kept ticking down until it reached 2022. Maybe if they stuck with the original date, none of this would have happened. Oh well. Now, I'd like to take time to point out that so far, up until this point, there is absolutely zero worry about the game being a scam. Sure, did it look maybe a little generic and rough around the edges? Maybe. But clearly, it was not enough to detract people from adding it to their Steam wish lists, myself included. Now, it is very rare for a studio to show their cards this early. We have nearly an hour of real gameplay footage put together between all of the released videos, and the game is almost a year away. I understand that fans want to see more gameplay and less cinematics, myself included. Show me what the game is. But still, by this point, it's very unlikely that the game is running anywhere near a polished state, and the gameplay we've seen is most likely set up or staged. May 2022. Another long period of radio silence ensues, until we hit May of 2022, where we get the announcement of the game's move to Unreal Engine 5, but a delayed release until March of 2023. June 2022. Luckily, we don't have to wait much longer for news as the infamous Volunteers articles begin to release in June of 2022. This is the point where the warning signs begin. The studio starts taking heat for requests of volunteer employees to help develop the game and moderate the community discord. January 2023. The Steam page for the day before gets taken down due to them failing to register a trademark for the game they've already been working on for four years. This leads them to announce an additional nine month delay due to said trademark issue. In the same month, the developers promised more gameplay, which didn't happen. They also tried to do a hostile takeover of the game's subreddit, which also was unsuccessful. February 2023 Not long after this drama, Fantastic released a statement saying that they were not reaching out to creators with early access keys to promote their game that wasn't out yet. Their new gameplay reveal was not well received by the community, as well as claims of trailer copying. Plus, there is a second trademark dispute with a... calendar app? April 2023. Early Access Beta Program gets announced. Keep in mind, the game's Steam page is still down at this point, but they promise it will be up soon. June 2023. An article releases from Well Played, talking with the Godosov brothers about the day before. Now, two interesting points are brought up during this article. One. Around the time of this release, Fantastic admits to have partnered with their publisher, Mytona, to create a new venture company aptly named Mytona Fantastic. What this is, why it was decided, we don't know. But there is a website registered, with nothing on it besides a contact page. The new company also became the official publisher for the day before. But as of today, Mytona still has the day before listed as one of their games on their website. Second point, arguably one of the most important as well, is them unwilling to disclose the server's intended player size as they were in the middle of testing. Now, 
I am not a game developer, nor an MMO expert, but this alone is a huge alarm to anyone thinking of purchasing the game. There are no specific requirements in terms of the size of an MMO server, but if the entire game is centered around being online with players interacting with them, target server size of how many will be in one world at one time should be one of the most important parts of the game. The article goes on to give a few details about gameplay and what to expect. But honestly, there isn't much here. Just a nice fluff piece that was ultimately disregarded by the community. August 2023. The day before, wanting to change their name in hopes of relieving themselves of the trademark issues they've suffered, have fallen into a third trademark dispute. It was reported that the day before was wanting to rebrand into Dayworld, but the name was already trademarked by Putnam Publishing Group, who published the Dayworld book trilogy written by Philip Jose Farmer. October 2023. The rebranding is now officially off the table as they're still scheduled for an early access release in December. We get a final launch trailer. Keep in mind the Steam page is still down at this point and has been for nearly 10 whole months. November 2023. Fantastic announces that they've won the trademark for the name The Day Before, and the Steam page is back up online. Console versions of the game have been delayed indefinitely and will release once the game leaves early access. December 2023. Christmas arrives early and the day before launches on Steam. Immediately, there's community backlash. Game-breaking bugs, crashes, server issues, underdeveloped gameplay, low player count, and an empty world. The game receives an overwhelming amount of negativity and bad reviews on Steam. Tweets were made from the fantastic official Twitter account addressing these issues and letting players know that fixes were incoming. But nearly as quick as these tweets were posted, on December 11th, 2023, Fantastic Studio announced its closure and thus the end of the day before. Now, if you bought an early access copy of the day before, you can still play it. The servers for the day before and prop night are still up and running. How long they will remain is yet to be seen. The studio has had some odd communication during this time period. More recent tweets addressing refunds along with replies have been made. It should be noted that the company has not changed their name back to 8 points, as has been rumored. If you remember, Hype Train Digital, the publishers of The Wild 8 and the buyers of the game, spoke with Eurogamer saying that they changed the name of the developers of The Wild 8 from Fantastic back to 8 points since it was receiving so much backlash. Fantastic Studios have not rebranded and truly have shut down. But there is one last strange reply. A user replied under one of the tweets asking if it's possible to sell the game to a different studio for it to be properly be made. Fantastic's response? Fantastic doesn't own the IP. Remember how I mentioned Mytona? Let's talk about them a bit. The company actually has a pretty interesting history, but most of it is unimportant to this video. But if you'd like to read more, I've linked a VentureBeat article in my sources down below. Now if you look at their website, Mytona says that they were founded in 2015. But this is not true. Mytona was officially founded in 2012 by brothers Alexei and Atfanzi Ushnitsky. Strangely enough, they were also founded in the city of Yakutsk, Russia. Same one as Fantastic, or at that point, 8 points, albeit 3 years earlier. 
In 2012, they released Secret Society, Mysteries of Darkwood, which would eventually reach 30 million downloads and generate more than $10 million in revenue. From that point onward, Mytona would grow considerably, releasing more mobile games, the most popular being Cooking Diaries, until their collaboration with Fantastic on Prop Night and receiving publishing rights. There is not a lot of information publicly available between the two companies in terms of how they came in contact with one another, or why for that matter. Itona was primarily a mobile game development and publishing studio, while Fantastic was focused on PC gaming. Now, this next part is going to come with a lot of speculation, so please listen to what I have to say with a massive grain of salt. I believe that there is a much more intimate relationship between Mytona and Fantastic that is being shown. Let's go over some of the data. Fact. Both companies were founded in the same city of Yakutsk, Russia. Fact. Both companies established offices in Singapore only a 15 minute drive apart. Fact. Mytona is an investor in Fantastic. At this point, you may not be convinced, but there is more. The same year as when the Fantastic office in Singapore was created, there was a new company started in New Zealand, the same country as the headquarters of Mytona. Mytona's public address is Level 5, 129, Hurstmere Road, Takapuna, Auckland, 0622. The name of the company I mentioned previously UB Hold Co. Limited. What was the filed registered address when the company was incorporated? Level 5, 129, Hurstmere Road, Takapuna, Ackland, 0622. Who were the people who filed for the incorporation of UB Hold Co. Limited? Afanzi and Alexei Ushnitsky, the same founders of Mytona. Who were the people that filed for the joint venture of Mytona Fantastic, the publisher of the day before? Afanzi and Alexei Ushnitsky, and two others, Asen Gotovsev and Eduard Gotovsev. The Ushnitsky brothers are the sole owners of Miney Limited, Mytona Holding Limited, Mytonaverse Holding Limited, Mytona IP Limited, Mytonaverse Limited, Mytonaverse IP Co. Limited, and joint owners on Mytona Fantastic Limited. All of these companies are registered to the same New Zealand address, and all of these companies are controlled by the parent of UB Hold Co. Limited. Interestingly enough, while doing research for this video, the registry pages were available on the business.gov.nz website. But now, they're all gone. I've emailed the website asking why these business pages were taken down, but have yet to receive a response. Fortunately, I saved a lot of these documents from the business.gov.nz website, which showcases a lot of the behind the scenes structure and organization of the companies. Most of the other companies I mentioned previously don't matter. The only two that do in this case are UB Hold Co. Limited and Mytona Fantastic Limited. Now, as I stated before, UB Hold Co. Limited owns Mytona and all of its sister companies, but they are only half owners of Mytona Fantastic. We can see here through the screenshot that the company Mytona Fantastic Limited is owned evenly between Mytona Holding Limited and Fantastic PTE Ltd. Mytona Holding Limited is a subsidiary of UB Holt Co. Limited, essentially meaning that Alexi and Afanzi do own half the company. I do not have any concrete evidence that Edward and Aysen are sole owners of Fantastic PTE Ltd, but Considering that they are listed as the only two other directors alongside the Yushnitsky brothers, it's safe to assume that they are. Okay, great. But what does this actually prove? Well, it proves that Mytona were not only just investors of the day before, but they were partial owners. On Mytona's website, Mytona Fantastic is listed as only the publisher of the game, 
not partial owner. Both Mitona and Fantastic are not publicly disclosing that neither of them are sole owners of the game. But hey, at least there is a company that owns the rights, right? So if they wanted to, they could sell it, right? About that. Fantastic Studios said that they won their trademark battle for the name the day before. As of the time of making this video, Fantastic Studio still does not own the trademark for the day before. There is another party at play. Their name is Sun J. Lee. This individual is the one who originally filed for the trademark of the day before, which led to it being taken off Steam for 10 months. As the time of making this video, the case is still ongoing. But let's say, hypothetically, Fantastic Studio actually does win the trademark battle. They own the trademark and intellectual property for the day before, right? Wrong. See, if we look into the assignment documents of the trademark filing, we find something interesting, specifically the last paragraph. Effective as of January 1st, 2023, for good and valuable consideration, the receipt and sufficiency of which are hereby acknowledged, Fantastic PTE LTD, a Singapore private limited company, a signer, conveys, transfers, and assigns to Mitona Fantastic Limited, a New Zealand limited company, a signee, with the address of level 5, 129 Hurstmere Road, Takapuna, Auckland, 0622 New Zealand, all rights, title, and interest in the United States in and to the names of the trademarks set forth in the Exhibit A hetero, including the U.S. trademark applications, therefore, and the goodwill of the business connected with the use of and symbolized by the name together with all rights of action occurred, occurring and to occur under and by virtue herefore, including the right to sue or otherwise recover for past infringement and receive all damages, payments, costs, and fees associated therewith. Signed away by Edward Gotosev, CEO of Fantastic PTE LTD. And what was Exhibit A exactly? If you were skeptical before, here it is in bold lettering. Mitona Fantastic are the sole owners of Prop Hunt and the day before. Now, what does this all mean? What does it all add up to? To be honest, I'm not entirely sure, but I do have a theory that again must be taken with a massive grain of salt. In the New Zealand tax policy, there is a section on software development costs in section DB40B of the Income Tax Act of 2007. It states that New Zealand law allows an immediate deduction for expenditure incurred on unsuccessful software development projects in the year that the development is abandoned. This provision, as outlined by the Inland Revenue Department's tax technical website, means that companies can claim a tax deduction for the costs incurred up to the point of abandonment, thus mitigating some of the financial impacts of the failed project. Therefore, it can be argued that Mitona Fantastic and its parent company, UB Holt Co. Limited, do have some incentive to abandon the project in order to claim a deduction on their company's taxes. Do I have any proof of this? No. But you cannot deny that there is a possibility that this was the cause for the abandonment of the day before. I do want to clear up one point that was made throughout the community during this time. No, Fantastic is not rebranding back to 8 points. The developer for their active games is still listed as Fantastic. Hype Train Digital changed the developer name to 8 points because their game, The Wild 8, was receiving a lot of backlash being associated with Fantastic. I hope that this game can be a lesson to the community to be patient. Wait and use your intuition and judgment when purchasing a new product like this. In another reality, the day before could have actually been a good game, but 
alas, here we are looking back at the ruins of a studio and a game which never stood a chance. Thank you all for watching. If you made it this far and enjoyed the video, please leave a like and a comment. I would greatly appreciate it. If you want to see more of this type of content, please consider subscribing. Uh, while I was making this video, my previous one talking about Baldur's Gate 3 and Spider-Man 2 surpassed 100,000 views, and it's nearly at 150,000 right now. And all I can say is thank you. Thank you to everyone who watched the video and interacted with it. It really does mean a lot seeing how well it's doing. I have a lot more topics I want to talk about, and I hope some of you who have watched this one or the previous one or both continue to support me. I really do enjoy making video essays like these, but they take a while to produce. Once again, one last time, thank you to anyone who has been a recent supporter to the channel, or an old one for that matter. That's it for me, but until then, I will see you all next time.